The religion of Islam is based on five fundamental pillars or principles. The first being Shahada or the declaration of faith. The second is Salah or praying five times a day. The third, Som or fasting in the month of Ramadan. The fourth, Zakah or compulsory charity. And the fifth pillar is the Hajj pilgrimage to the holy city of Mecca. Hajj, the holy spiritual journey to the house of Allah, the Kaaba. This is the historical and geographical epicenter of Islam. As all believers are in deep willingness to visit this holy place as Allah Almighty gave Mecca an advantage over any other place in the world. Mecca is at a special point on the earth's surface. The city's proportions in distance to the north and south poles and also the proportion of eastern and western elongation are equal to the golden mean or golden ratio of 1.618, also known as the divine proportion. All practicing Muslims everywhere in the world prostrate themselves toward the Kaaba in Mecca five times a day. And if they are able to afford it, visit this holy city at least once in their lifetime to perform the Hajj pilgrimage. But there is more to the science of the Hajj than just the rituals. Any discussion on the science of Hajj needs to be formulated within the framework of the book of signs, which is Al-Quran. And the Holy Quran is a divinely revealed book of God. And because the science of Hajj itself is something which is beyond the physical and has to do with the metaphysical and the celestial and the divine, we have to formulate it within the framework of the book of signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is the Holy Quran. Muslims adhere to the commandments of Allah as contained in the Holy Quran. These commandments were revealed to Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Muslims also follow the teachings, examples and actions of Prophet Muhammad. And the Hajj pilgrimage is one such action or form of worship of Allah. Hajj is simply a recreation of that very first journey when that person is born. We go to the house that was the first house built ever on this earth, as we believe. Al Quran specifies that. The first house of worship that was ever built on this earth, our book specifies, is the one that is in Mecca. And therefore, this is the place where Adam, our father, the father of all humanity, was there, was there and built this house, established this house. And that house, we believe, was kept until the great flooding at the time of Nuh or Noah. Then the house was almost entirely gone except for little foundations that, that were remnant. And then our Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Creator, ordered Ibrahim alayhi or Abraham to re-establish the house. وَإِذْ يَرْفَعُ إِبْرَاهِيمُ الْقَوَاعِدَ مِنَ الْبَيْتِ Al Quran says. The house is just a symbol. It's a symbol that the first human being that came here to worship the Creator and to positively contribute. The very first mandate of Adam, as we believe in our book in the Quran, was استعمركم فيها. O Adam, go down, go down to earth and positively construct earth. So the mission of Adam and then therefore the mission of the children of Adam is to positively construct earth. So when Adam built that house, that's a sign of that this faith and this human being who is Adam and then his children are, uh, eventually are positive contributors, they build. And they build in recognition that they are human beings and that they're not disconnected from their creator, their creation, and they're connected to the creator. If you look at the construction of the Holy Kaaba in the era of Adam and Eve, as well as the subsequent reconstruction by Abraham, Ibrahim alayhi salatu salam and Ismail his son, you will note that it was rectangular in structure and not cubic as it is right now. When the Kaaba was rebuilt just a few years before the Prophet, peace be upon him, received his first revelation, the Quraysh tribe of Mecca agreed to only use income from pure sources to complete the rebuild. 
Due to the paucity of untainted or halal money at the time, they were unable to rebuild the Kaaba to its original size and shape. When we look at the geometry of the Holy Kaaba, it was initially rectangular and it was built at a height of plus minus 13.1 meters and if you include the open enclosure which we know as the Hatim today it comes to plus minus 21.2 meters if you put them together and you work it according to the the fee as they know it as the golden ratio you will find that the, the measurements of the Holy Kaaba from a geometric perspective conforms to the golden ratio this 1,618 golden ratio is found in all aspects of nature and the first house of worship which was built was built on that natural harmonious mathematical calculation of 1,618. When we look at the Holy Kaaba from an astronomical perspective you will note that the long axis of the Holy Kaaba is directed towards the star which is known as Corpus Canopus in the constellation Carina and it is known as Suhail in Arabic. Interestingly enough, NASA uses Corpus Canopus to direct itself towards the heavens when it wants to move into heaven for the purposes of navigation. And because the Holy Kaaba is aligned to the Corpus Canopus star, it also gives us a mystical dimension to the direction of the Holy Kaaba and its inclination and alignment to the heavens and opens up an access and a portal for us to access the celestial heavens as well. It is not a chance that Adam was sent to that place and built that place through divine orders. And obviously we as Muslims believe that every human being's heart could be a Kaaba in a sense. And, and every human being's heart could be that center of illumination and compassion to the world. The Kaaba as a symbol for the Muslim's faith. It symbolizes the unity of the human beings as human beings and as all equal creation before the Creator. It also symbolizes the unity that outside of the Kaaba, before we go in, we may be wearing normal clothing. Once we go there, we're all almost shrouded by just a simple white towel. That's also the, to bring a concept that shines some divine qualities onto us that we're, we're creation. We ought to remember that we're equal. When you look at the Holy Kaaba itself and you look at its construction, you will realize that it is a prototype of the frequently uh, visited house of Almighty God, which is known as Baytul Ma'mur, which is mentioned in the Holy Quran, which is frequented by the angels in the celestial heavens. And the wisdom behind the circumambulation and the tawaf as the night of the Holy Kaaba going around the Holy Kaaba is because it mimics the behavior of the angels who frequent Baytul Ma'mur or the most frequented house. 70,000 angels enter that celestial house of worship of Almighty God in the heavens daily. And they only have one chance of entry to engage in worship and they never get a chance again. And this also mimics a higher level of worship of Almighty God wherein the, the closest angels, the angels brought Near, who are known as the Hamilan of the Arsh or the bearers of the throne of God and those angels that are around the throne of God engage in circumambulation around the throne of God. So in this way the Holy Kaaba became a prototype of houses of worship or places of worship which are not only found on planet earth which human beings inhabit but it is similar to those uh, areas which are found in the celestial heavens wherein the angels engage in worship of Almighty God through the purpose of circumambulation as well as around the throne of God with the angels that have been appointed for that duty. An integral part of worship when visiting the Holy Kaaba in Mecca is to perform the tawaf or circumambulation. This is done seven times before performing any other prayer or ritual. However, there is a deep mystical dimension and reason for performing this act counterclockwise. When we look at the, the concept of circumambulation of the Holy Kaaba or tawaf as it is known, we will note that it, it is conducted counterclockwise.
as opposed to being clockwise. But counterclockwise and clockwise are purely relative in the sense that uh, looking at it from a different perspective, if one observes Earth from the North Pole, you will see that the Earth is rotating on its axis counterclockwise. This, the Moon is rotating around, uh, around the Sun counterclockwise and the planets are rotating around the Sun as well counterclockwise. But if you look at it from the South, these are all purely relative. Similarly, the electrons in, in the atom are also moving in what they know as a counterclockwise position. But all of these are relative. The point being that the motion of all the celestial bodies and all the planets and all of th those things which are to be found within us as well, our atoms, the cytoplasm in our nucleus and so on, they all are engaged in a motion which is a secular motion. So Muslims engage in the tawaf or the circumambulation of the Holy Kaaba primarily in imitation of the angels who circumambulate the throne of Almighty Allah in a very similar manner. And the angels in the Baytul Ma'amur, the frequented house, do the same. But we see a similar pattern because what is, is above is below as well. And we follow that same pattern in, in nature and in the universe with the clockwise or the counterclockwise motion, the circular motion. And this indicates to us there that we, be, we are in harmony with the universe, we are in harmony with planet Earth, and we are in harmony with the, with the workings of the universe as Almighty Allah has created it. Maybe there's a spiritual balancing going on in the world somehow. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us that everything spans its orbit. Everything spans an orbit and that orbit is not is ordained, instructed to do so. It's, it's meticulously found. So we're spanning an orbit and I'm sure that's one orbit out of many. Similarly, we understand that there are seven circumambulations or cir seven circuits of circumambulation of Tawaf. And this also has a great deal of meaning purely from a religious perspective as well as a scientific perspective as well, if you may look at it from that perspective. Muslim scholars like Ibn Qayyim al jawziyyah have spoken about the significance of the number seven. And we look at it from a Quranic perspective. The Holy Quran says, Verily, O Prophet of God, we have granted you the, so the seven oft-repeated verses, which are indicative of the opening chapter of the Holy Quran, Surah Fatiha. Similarly, the creation of man according to the Holy Quran is also in seven stages. And the Quran speaks about the heavens and the earth as Allah has described the heavens and the earth way beyond our earthly heavens or the cosmic heavens, but beyond that to the celestial heavens. Quran speaks about the seven strata of heavens and earth, and we have seven days in the week. In this way, here we bring in that number which is very common in nature with regards to anything which is has of significant value which has the number seven which is attributed to the process of circumambulation as well. Very important is the fact that the Holy Kaaba is a point of orientation. It is a physical point of orientation when we are praying to God. But that physical point of orientation which is the Holy Kaaba is symbolic of our inner orientation of our heart towards Almighty God. So the reason why we don't stand in front of the Holy Kaaba when we are in the presence of the, in the precincts of the Holy Haram and instead we circumambulate it is to ensure Sure that the reality of the worship of God and the omnipresence of God is made fixed in our minds that wherever you turn, wherever you turn, you will find the visage or the countenance of God or the face of God. The human being is a human being at the end of the day with its spirit, not with its body and what covers the body. And that's why when we go and do circles and what we call tawaf around the Kaaba itself, which is that holy place, it's supposed to cleanse us from our sins, that turning around it is supposed to drop and shed all the, uh, uh, the, the imperfections that we have. And it's supposed to be a source of illumination, a fountain of, of, of illumination and purification. And therefore, we insist always in teaching about pilgrimage. When you go around the Kaaba, your heart is supposed to circulate before your body. And you're supposed to be connected in that circles around the, this divine house because the whole universe is circling anyway. Everything is in going in sort of semi-circular motion. And that's just a sign that we are a creation and we all, all everything that's going in circles eventually is imbibing from the might of the Almighty. The black stone or Hajar al-Aswad is the eastern cornerstone of the Kaaba. It is revered by Muslims as an Islamic relic which, according to history, dates back to the time of Adam and Eve. It is believed to be celestial with cosmic powers. The Station of Abraham is the rock upon which he stood while erecting the Kaaba. 
his son Ishmael helped him erect it by passing him the rocks. A glass and metal enclosure protects what is said to be an imprint of Abraham's feet. I think the most mystical aspect about this black stone uh, is a couple of things. First, it was touched and kissed by someone that 1.6 billion Muslims love more than themselves, and which is our Prophet Wasallam. So the mere thought that this black stone, and it's a stone, but was touched by the person who Allah sent as a mercy to the, to the worlds, the compassion to the worlds, the unconditional compassion to the worlds, the love to the worlds, the values of justice to the worlds, that gives us a different, a special value, obviously, and a different look. And I imbibe from that kind of spirituality. The Quran states that Ibrahim, together with his son Ishmael, raised the foundations of the Holy House. After the placing of the black stone in the eastern corner of the Kaaba, Ibrahim received a revelation in which Allah told the aged prophet that he should now go and proclaim the pilgrimage to mankind. In this way, Almighty God gave prominence to the standing place of Ibrahim and the Quran says, we should وَاتَّخِذُوا مِن مَقَامِ إِبْرَاهِيمَ musalla and make the station and the standing place of Abraham the place of prayer for you. We understand from this that in the sight of God, even earthly stones which are connected with the beloved ones of God, who are the vicegerents of God on earth and who are his messengers on earth, have a great deal of significance by virtue of being attached to the preference of God and the beloved ones of God. And they have equal value in the sight of God as those which have come from celestial um, origins like the Hajjul Aswad which is the black stone. The Prophet peace be upon him has said, the black stone was sent down from the heavens whiter than milk and it was blackened by the sins of man. Before his prophethood, he arbitrated between warring tribes who wanted to claim ownership of the black stone. So the tribes wanted to fight for it and fighting for it, they almost killed each other. Emerged now the Prophet wasallam, and he took his, uh, his own, uh, some piece of clothing that he, was, he clothed himself with on top of his regular clothing and he put the black stone and he said each of you carries one corner of that black stone basically solving the problem telling us that violence is the language of the inarticulate and we have to find ways to work things together that was one of the first indications that that was before he announced his prophecy that was the first indication or one of the many first indications that this is a prophet of peace and love and unconditional compassion and that violence is absolutely contradictory to the essence of his message. Islamic history states that the Zamzam well was revealed to Hagar, the second wife of Abraham and mother of Ishmael. Hagar ran seven times back and forth in the scorching heat between the two hills of Safa and Marwa, looking for water for her infant son. Then, miraculously, water sprang out of the dry, hot desert. This water in itself, because it was through the blessings of an angel that this water burst forth, has blessings, inherent blessings in it as well. And the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, has stated that drink the Zamzam water because it is a water of blessing. And moreover, the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, stated that it is a cure for sickness and it is water as well as food meaning it has the ability to nourish a person from the point of view of not only quenching one's thirst but also staving away the pangs of hunger. Similarly, the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, speaking about its scientific importance. And if you look at Zamzam from that perspective, Zamzam is what we would call magnetized water. And the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, stated the impact of the water is with the intention with which you drink it. So with whatever intention you drink it, that type of positive impact will be found in your being. It is important to know that we are almost 75% water ourselves and the molecular structure of water changes, even ordinary water changes when we place a warm word on the water itself. Or if we say a harsh word and the molecular structure of the water changes, this is with ordinary water. But Muslims believe that because this is a water of great blessing and has come from, from sources which are angelic, 
Kundalini, if you may call that, we understand that this has a greater magnetism in it. And if we uh, direct our attention and our conviction and our own hopes and desires in that water, that water can also alter its molecular structure. And because of its spiritual ma uh, magnetism, it can effect a change in us both physically as well as spiritually. It seems like a struggle for the right reason will always pay off. It seems like there's a message from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Creator, telling us, if you have a good intention and you're struggling for the right reason, I will never leave you alone. I will, you'll never be by yourself. I will always be there for you. Even if you're in the middle of the desert, in the middle of nowhere where it's, it's almost inevitable death, but I will have water explode out of the desert to bring life. Right when you thought death was coming, water came out of the desert. That's what the well of Zamzam was. The well of Zamzam is a, it's a symbol. It's, yes, it is water, but it's a symbol of life. It's a symbol of hope. It's a symbol of opportunity. It's a symbol of growth. It's a symbol of peace, because that's when things grow. And in the middle of the desert, to, for this to happen, on the hand of a woman, showing you that, that link between that woman and life, that she was representing life, that she represents hope. And that's what our deen and that's what our faith represents. Over the five days of the Hajj, the Muslim pilgrim follows in the footsteps of Prophet Ibrahim, visiting the significant sites of worship and performing rituals over a five square kilometer area immersed in the spiritual and historical knowledge of his wife Hajra and his son Ishmael. When we look at the five days of Hajj, which are the most important events in during the Hajj pilgrimage itself, we will notice that primarily it is associated with the patriarch of the three Abrahamic faiths, namely Abraham alayhi salatu salam, namely Judaism, Christianity and Islam. And we understand that the entire process of Hajj being at Arafah, being at Muzdalifah, being at Mina, and the sacrifices and the, and the stoning of the devil, the symbolic stoning of the devil, all are associated with events which took place in the life of Sayyidina Ibrahim alayhi salatu salam, Abraham, his son Ismail, and his wife Hajra. And it brings us to the philosophy and the wisdom behind this in the sense that Hajj is all about us as individuals and us as people of, of greater humanity. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala willed that some places are more honorable than others and sometimes are more honorable than others. So Arafah was designated as time and place, both at the highest level of close, spiritual closeness to the Creator and the most opening for the creation to be connected with their Creator. You went around the Kaaba, now go, forget the Kaaba, go to the Lord of the Kaaba. Move and travel from the creation to the creator, no longer from the creation to the creation. Stoning of the devil or stoning of the Jamarat is part of the annual Hajj pilgrimage. It is one of a series of ritual acts that must be performed in an area called Mina. The Jamarat are three stone pillars which are pelted in emulation of Prophet Ibrahim at the three locations where Satan tried to dissuade him from sacrificing his son Ishmael. Peace be upon them. The stoning is performed on the day of Eid ul adha and two or three days after. Following the ritual sacrifice of an animal in honor of Prophet Ibrahim and Ishmael's loyalty to God, every pilgrim must cut or shave their hair as a symbolic act of cleansing. It must be noted, however, that when we look at the process of sacrifice in following in the footsteps of the Prophet Abraham and in the sacrifice of his son Ismail alayhi salatu salam, whilst Muslims engage in the physical process of sacrificing an animal during the day of Eid al-Adha, its value and its significance is not about the sacrifice itself per se. But the Holy Quran says it is not the blood nor the meat that reaches Almighty God. It is your God consciousness that reaches Him. It's your commitment to Him that reaches Him. It is your willingness to sacrifice in His path which reaches Him. And therefore, the socio-spiritual significance comes forth in the sense that we take all of that meat or at least a portion of the meat and we distribute it to the poor and the needy. All these divine evidences show that the creator of the world and mathematics is the same one and single God. The indefinable and great force that has created the Holy Kaaba in the blessed city of Mecca. 
he reminds mankind that he has granted signs to all humanity on the basis of his foreknowledge about the future and the common languages of humans that is love, devotion, peace and unity. This is the ultimate science of the Hajj. When we look at all of these five foundational pillars, you will see that it has a time frame attached to it as well. So what the Shahada or the testimony of faith is for a moment, what the Salah is for a day, what fasting is for a month, what Zakah is for a year, the Hajj is for a lifetime. It's the pilgrimage of the souls, not the body. The point of Hajj is that this is a journey of transformation, not a journey of information. You go there not to take mental pictures, but you go there to arrive at spiritual illumination and you go there for transformation, spiritual transformation.